Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back. We got some more bite-sized business advice for you. And we're talking about an important topic, payroll. If you have employees, you must pay them legally. And that's always a good practice too. So we definitely want to encourage that here on this show. Uh, but we want to tell you about how to do it the right way and you know, maybe some pitfalls to avoid, some common questions we all may have. I know I went through this journey back in my last business when I was just starting. I hired my first employee and I was like, ah, I know I have to pay them. How do I pay them? We're going to unpack all of that today, wherever you are in your uh, business building journey. And we have a special guest with us today. I have the CEO, founder, and self-proclaimed chief cook and bottle washer of Get Payroll, and that is Charles Reed. So before we go any further, Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Brandon, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. It, I'm excited for this conversation um, because it, there is a lot of confusion around this aspect of growing a business. And that's, you know, some people decide to just pay their employees using some third-party company. Some people outsource it. Some people figure out how to do it on, the, on their own. There's so many questions around payroll. And then there's the taxes and the government piece to it. Very complex. Uh, so thankfully, you're here to simplify that for us. Um, but I'm curious, uh, what got you started in, in this industry with Get Payroll? Well, when I left corporate world and hung out my shingle as a CPA, was doing accounting with payroll for my clients. Uh, we just operated a small service bureau. It continued to grow. I sold off my accounting practice to the, my partner that I'd taken on, and I kept the payroll portion that he didn't want. Uh, and I just, I like the payroll business. So I, I assume, I mean, you have an accounting background, um, always good that you like what you do, but what was the what was the incentive then to start to start get payroll? I mean, what was the problem in the marketplace that you saw that you just love helping your clients with? Well, our unique selling proposition is compliance. All of our competitors do a reasonably good job of, of producing paychecks. But the IRS makes millions of mistakes every year. And being a CPA and a US tax court practitioner, I'm able to do things in the compliance area that my competitors either can't or won't do. I'll take on professional responsibility. I take a 2848, a limited power of attorney from every client. This allows me to advocate for them with the internal revenue service, not just send information. So when the IRS screws up or the client screws up, uh, I get in there and fix it. Uh, the IRS in 2019, before COVID, issued $13 billion in employment tax penalties. We abate almost all the penalties that our clients get hit with because in most cases, they're wrong. And in cases, other cases, the IRS is overreaching. For your, for your listeners, the IRS cannot penalize you for a simple mistake. They can only penalize you for gross negligence. Now, of course, they can get the taxes and the interest, but they can't get penalties unless you're gross negligent. Of course, the IRS wants to say everything is gross negligence. So if you have an advocate like us to fight the IRS and to appeal these things and knows how to deal with the IRS and all their regulations and all the laws and up to and including taking clients case to tax court for them, uh, you know, if you can't do that, you're going to lose. Yeah, and it, it's a scary position to be in, right? Like you're you're fighting the IRS. You probably an organization you don't want to go up against if you're uneducated or by yourself. Um, so I'm curious, what are some of these things? Because this is this is a new conversation for me. Um, I, I I'm not aware of all the compliance. I don't do payroll. That's not my thing. Um, but what 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 are we talking about when you say compliance? At, in terms of, of payroll? Well, it's you have to have filed everything on a timely basis. Everything you need to file 
and everything filed on a timely basis. You need to have made all your tax deposits and made them on a timely basis. Anything can 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 screw that up. Uh, from arithmetical errors, which are a big error, to not knowing what to file, not knowing when to file it, not knowing what to pay, not knowing when to pay it. So any of these things can cause penalties, late filing penalties, non-filing penalties, late deposit penalties, uh, inadequate uh, uh, deposits that aren't uh, large enough will, will cause a penalty. So there's a lot of reasons these happen. There's a lot of mistakes the IRS makes. Remember, the IRS is 100,000 civil servants. They have no profit motive. Uh, they work there 40 hours a week and go home. So they don't have the same motive that a business person, an entrepreneur has in dealing with customers. They, they just don't. They're not bad people, but they just don't have the same incentive. Their systems are old. Their budget is limited. Their training is, is poor in many cases. And so errors happen. Some of the some of the software they're using and hardware goes back to the 1960s and is terribly obsolete. So uh, when these errors happen, if you don't know how to handle them, uh, we had a we had a case. It took nine years to solve. A client had mistakenly, when he sent in his 1099s, uh, had it only sent in for the management, not for the the workers. They they notified him. Uh, a while later, he sent them all in, and there was no tax due. They penalized him uh, $80,000, $100 per 1099, and then interest in penalties on top of that. And we fought that and appealed it and appealed it and appealed it, got it all the way up to the uh, uh, district guys, and, and he wouldn't return my call. So I called the deputy chief of appeals in in D.C., who he worked for, and said, Shelly, I can't get a hold of this guy. He works for you. She said, I'll, I'll have him call you. He called me that afternoon, and we talked through the thing. We put it in another appeals office, and three months later, my client got a $400 refund instead of a $95,000 bill. It took nine years That's crazy to do that, okay, through numerous steps. Um, I had a client who had got two W-2s. And we took it to tax court because the IRS said, tough, just pay the taxes on all that income that you really didn't make. Uh, so we took it to tax court for our client. It went to docketed appeals after the petition was filed. Uh, the district counsel called me up. I explained the situation. He said, oh, oh never mind. <laughs> it all went away. But you've got to file that petition. You've got to know what to do. And you've got to know what to, what to say when the district counsel calls. That's the IRS attorney. So these are things we do and we do very well. Yeah, that's yeah. I haven't heard any stories like that. I'm sure they're out there and you deal with them every single day. But that stuff's scary when you're running a business like this is this is the stuff where you want to avoid. You, you don't want to enter this situation if possible. And then if you do, you want to have someone on your side to fight it for you. And who knows what to say, when to say, like you say it, like you said. So um, I'm curious, though, because as you're saying this stuff, I've never heard any of it. Um, which scares me because I've only used payroll companies. Like, I mean, I've used all the, the big players, if you will, like QuickBooks, uh, ADP, Gusto. I mean, that's your competition, I would assume. Are these companies doing that stuff? No. If, if you call up your ADP rep and want to talk to a CPA, they'll tell you to call your own CPA. Hmm. And if your own CPA was a payroll tax expert, he'd be doing your payroll already. So you're presenting him with a problem he's not aware of and doesn't know how to handle. He's not an expert at it. That's what we do. That's why I became a U.S. tax court practitioner, so I could take my client's cases to tax court if need be. But I'm a CPA, and our, our competitors won't take a 2848. They cannot advocate for you with the Internal Revenue Service because they don't want the professional liability. Well, I can't say that I blame them, but that's not how we operate. We take professional responsibility for what we do for our clients and solve their problems. Mm, yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is those those companies are obviously, um, they're out for numbers, right? They want more clients, and that's really all they care about. 
Um, do you have a, a sweet spot of business owner you work with in terms of maybe revenue, employees, stuff like that? Yeah, actually, we go after the under under 20 employee market. Uh, we handle all sizes of businesses. Don't don't misunderstand. We have clients that are in the hundreds of hundreds of employees. But first of all, anything over 100 is is very difficult because our competitors are frankly whores in the marketplace and will do whatever it takes to, to get the business. And, and I don't want to compete on that basis. That makes me very uncomfortable professionally to to act like that. So our sweet spot is really the 20, 20 employee and under market, which is 95% of all US businesses. Yeah. Our competitors can have the other 5%. We'll just take that 95%. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and quite honestly, I mean, that at that size, that's probably where you're going to cross the line of internal payroll, like like an internal accounting department and stuff like that, right? About Somewhere, 20? no, really about 500 employees, a company needs to take it in-house. Hmm, okay. Uh, at, at, 20, at 20, though, you're having somebody else other than the boss do it. Definitely. Five yeah. people, the boss is still doing payroll. At 10 or 12, he's got, Sally's doing it now, okay? So, and that, you lose, start to lose control, and Sally may or may not be honest. You would be amazed at how many companies get cheated because their payroll person starts pocketing the payroll taxes, and they don't mm -hmm. find out about it for several years. And then uh, I had a plastic surgeon here locally who I talked to to try and help. Uh, his bookkeeper his head bookkeeper nurse had left and he, one of the girls in the office said she wanted to do the job. And uh, three years later, he had her prosecuted for uh, ex, um, embezzlement and she spent a couple of years in the uh, local lockup because of that. But he was out $100,000 that he still had to pay to the IRS. That he thought he did pay, which is crazy. Yep. How, how does one even do that i mean isn't that part of the whole like using a third-party platform or were they doing it in-house where she could just you know separate the bank accounts she was doing it in-house okay and right. she was cooking the books and pocketing the money it's not it happens all the time it is it is just endemic because you're you have all this money and if you don't pay it in the irs doesn't say anything very quickly you, know, you don't file the forms and you don't pay the taxes and until the W-2s get filed and then get reviewed a year later. So it'll be two years or more before the IRS says anything. And then they send a letter. And if you're opening the mail too, you just don't show the boss the letter. And now it gets worse and worse and worse. And somewhere around three, four years, uh, an IRS uh, revenue officer will come knocking on the door. And, or... In term of the plastic surgeon, they seized his retirement account. Hmm. That's brutal. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine that situation. And that's, <laughs> if, if nothing else, a sales pitch to use a company like yours because you don't want that live. I can't even imagine being in that situation. I, I really can't. Like that would, I don't know what I would do. That would be awful for that to happen. It would be. In, in you know, it, it could it could literally destroy your business because you mm -hmm. still have to pay all the taxes. Yeah. Maybe, just maybe if you do it right, you can avoid the penalties. Mm -hmm. But you don't have you really don't have an excuse. You didn't do due diligence. You're the boss and you didn't check this. So, you're pretty much on the hook and it can get the the IRS is uh, the IRS is not on your side. <laughs> no, they're not. Not a fun organization to mess with. I've I've been there, uh, and that's that's not a battle you want to fight. So, uh, yeah, good good advice there. So, I'm curious when you're uh, either taking on a new client or you're just starting to work with them, what are some of the things that they're they're surprised to learn about uh, payroll? Maybe they've been doing something wrong or they've overlooked something. What are the commonalities there? One of the big things that small businesses and startups make is classification errors. Who's an employee and who's a contractor? There's all kinds of advantages to having independent contractors. You don't have to file anything. You don't have to make deposits. You just write them a check and go on about your business. At the end of the year, if you think about it, you send in a 1099. 
Well, that's not a choice you get to make, nor does your worker get to make that choice. There's a whole body of law which changes. Just last month, a new regulation from the Labor Department went into effect concerning who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. And if you don't understand that, you can find yourself a year or two down the line with a huge problem when they come in and said, well, this person's really an employee. So everything that uh, should have been withheld, you need to deposit and you missed all these filings. So here's all the penalties and interest on everything that should have been paid. And oh, the fact that you paid him and he's gone, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, you still owe that money. I don't, we don't care if you paid it to him instead. Really? Bam. Oh, wow. this can, I've, I've had clients and want to be clients and, and people come to me with problems and it'll, it'll be five, six figures of, of taxes and interest and penalties hmm. that can literally put a business out of business. Uh, and you will get audited. The, the, one of the triggers is, a an ex worker that goes down and says, I need my unemployment. And the unemployment department says, we have no record of you being an employee. Well, I worked for so-and-so for the last two years. They're, they're going to come out and audit you. Yeah. <laughs> and beyond that, you will get audited by the state unemployment people. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So you will get audited and they will want to look at all your, the, all your checks that you wrote, all the people you paid for whatever reason, and then they'll determine if they think they're an independent contractor or an employee. And if you didn't choose right, it can get very expensive. And if you really upset the state auditor, he'll make sure it goes to the IRS and they'll be out. That's brutal. I, I'm curious. I haven't heard about this law. Can you unpack like what's the general criteria of employee versus contractor? Well, it, there's there's several bases. One is the ABC test, which a lot of states use. Uh, another is the 20 common law rules, which is what the courts use to determine. But the new one from the IRS it has really and I've gotten several I have several blogs on this uh, blogs on this where I've I've gone into the the details. But They've now said that if what you do is integral to the business, you're basically an employee. And if you're being paid, who pays anything that's not integral to your business? Okay. And if you, or then another one is you're economically dependent upon the, the company that pays you. If you're economically dependent, you're an employee. Well, you know, if they're paying me, I'm I'm economically dependent upon them to pay me. So uh, there's there's a whole lot of this. They they uh, any of your listeners can go out to uh, get payroll on on YouTube, and there are several videos on this, including one very current one uh, on independent contractors versus employees. Yeah, well, definitely, I'll have Charles send me that. We'll link that specific video in the show notes down below, wherever you're watching or listening. Um, that seems like a money grab, though, from the IRS. I mean, it, technically, so we we do fractional COO work. Occasionally, we'll work on a 1099 basis. But if we're your stand-in COO, we are integral to your business. I would never expect to be classified as an employee. That's absurd. Well, that's the problem with the new regulation from the Biden administration. That I, I've, I've spoken on that and written on that. Uh, I responded to the uh, the proposed rule. And it really can be a disaster. It's going to depend on what the courts do over the next few years, because they can, of course, overrule uh, just a regulation from the Labor Department and say that that's not valid or constitutional. And I don't think that it it may not hold up. But if it does, it, it basically could destroy the gig economy because yeah. who, who's paying? Uh, it says if, you know. If you're if you're paying them and deducting that pay, then that makes it integral to the business and economically dependent and all those other things. Uh, so yeah, I mean they say there's six factors and the totality of them and so on, but it the, it's a real change from what the Trump administration had proposed, 
and a change from what had been there before that. Because the Trump one, um, Biden, when he came into office, uh, their new labor secretary killed uh, the proposed Biden rule that was supposed to go into effect in March of 20. And this is the new one that just went into effect last month. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like it should be some other really important criteria, like a number of hours worked in the business. I mean, if they're there like 30 hours plus, that's, yeah, that's an employee. Like stop, stop cheating the rules. But if they're there five hours a week, but still integral to the business. That's, this stuff's crazy. Okay. It, if, if you go in as a fractional COO and have to solve a major problem and spend two weeks at a location, 50, 60 hours a week, are you an employee? The well, hours worked. Okay. For those two weeks, yeah. you're an employee, but the other ones you're not. I'm, come on. Exactly. It, it That's what I mean. Really it's like there's so much fluid to that, that it doesn't, it's crazy. Well, it, it is. And you have to be very, small businesses have to be very careful because it's just so easy to say, yeah, you know, here's 500 bucks. Thanks. I'll mm -hmm. see you next week. You, you can't do that. You have to know whether they're an employee or an independent contractor and pay them appropriately. It's not a choice. Neither the employer nor the worker gets to choose. It's a whole body of law and you have to be aware of it because people say, no, just pay me as an independent contractor. Put me on 1099. That's okay. No, no. They don't get to make that choice. That's one of the big problems that small businesses have is classification. The next one is, what are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to fill out? Where are they supposed to fill it out? You know, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what forms to do, what deposits to make. And it's critical that you do that. And it's critical that you keep up with the changes because it yeah. changes all the time. Yeah, I think that's what I'm I'm gathering from this episode. So you've you've completely terrified me. That's where I'm at after this. I'm I'm scared to ever write another paycheck, <laughs> hire another employee. <laughs> Um, but you are also here to help us through this. So I put your, you have a book that I put on the screen, uh, a free book that you're willing to offer to our listeners, which is fantastic. It's also in the show notes, wherever you're watching or listening. So the payrollbook.com, uh, and you showed it to me. It is a physical book before we started recording and it's a hefty one, 300 pages about how to use payroll to grow your business. Also do it the right way. So uh, it is. It's, it, it's a reference book. It, it'll also, if you have insomnia, just keep it on your nightstand. It'll put you to sleep pretty quick. <laughs> I love it. Quite the sales pitch for the book. If you want to learn more about <laughs> Charles and Get Payroll, you can go to getpayroll.com. Um, Charles, this is, I am scared. I'm not lying to you, but this is an insightful episode because now at least I know how the questions to ask and I know what to be prepared for. And I hope the listeners do too. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing just a little bit of your vast wisdom in this area. My pleasure. For those of you watching and listening, if you are just as scared as me, uh, all the links in the show notes down below to have somebody help you with payroll, get those questions answered, or at least have a resource uh, to see if you're doing it right or wrong. Um, I highly suggest you reach out to an expert in this area because uh, like Charles and like Get Payroll, because uh, I can tell you, being on the receiving end of an IRS letter is no fun and not having someone to fight for you is even less fun. So don't get yourself there. Make sure you do it the right way and don't get caught uh, in, a, in a pickle that you really don't know how to solve and owe yourself a lot of money. So wherever you are, make sure you subscribe. We love having you as a listener. And we'll be back tomorrow on another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. See you then.